In this video, we show how to install and configure a new Windows agent. It's quite long because a few steps are required to set this up properly. We are starting with a fully operational automation engine and show how to install the agent on a Windows system that was added to the environment. The procedure requires specific steps and we recommend you follow them closely and in sequence. First, make sure the Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 package is installed. For assistance, consult the Microsoft documentation. Then we update the Windows local security policy and add the user who will be starting the agent to the rights assignment. This ensures that this user has sufficient privileges to execute batch processes and more. Then we show how to configure the agents prior to startup with the INI file. We install the right agents based on the system level using the executable. We then start the agents. We use a command to run a simple test job on the new agents. Finally, we add the new agent to the service manager so as to stop and start this agent remotely without having to do so locally and manually. In order for the agent to operate properly, the Windows user who executes agent processes on the Windows system needs certain privileges defined in the local security policy. We've listed them here and the function of each is documented. Before we start the agent, as for any atomic automation components, we need to update the agent's configuration file. There's quite a bit of information in the file, but we focus on three specific items, namely the agent name, which can be different from the host name, the atomic system name, as it was defined when the engine was installed, and the engine host name, so that the agent is able to communicate with the engine over a CP process. We also check the process port. For the sake of clarity, we start with two systems. The green background is a Windows system called WinAAM, which has the automation engine, which is fully functional. The blue background is a brand new Windows system in the environment called WinAGT. We install the Windows agent on the system. It's assumed that the systems are networked, resolve each other's names, and have a shared directory where we can copy files. We strongly advise against using IP addresses in our configuration files it's just not a good idea. On the WinAM Green system, we find the installation package, which was downloaded from our download center. It contains a directory called Agents, with a subdirectory called Windows. We copy this directory to a shared drive, linked to the temp directory of the blue WinAgent system. The new Windows host is a 64-bit system, so we copy the right directory. We also copy the example directory, which contains the UCBTX command, which is a basic sleep command that is very useful for testing purposes. Let's consider the contents of the directory. The directory contains a number of files, namely the installation executable, the agent, and the config file. We will return to this. In order for the agent to operate properly, the user who starts it has to have certain privileges on the system. While the agent should be installed by the local system administrator, we recommend creating a user dedicated to day-to-day -day agent operations. In our case, that user is called User1. Local security policy is accessible through the Windows control panel, but we simply search with SecPol. Once in the local security policy, we head to the user rights assignments. The dedicated user must be added to the following rights. We're not going to explain them in detail, they're documented. We just show how to update one of these. The procedure is the same for all of them.
We now install the agents. For this, we return to the package we installed in the temp directory, and as the administrator, we execute setup.exe. By default, the agent is installed on the C drive under Atomic and then Agents. That directory contains a subdirectory Windows. In there, we find the bin directory with all the files. There are two files. The exe is the agent itself. Executing it starts the agent. The INI file contains the configuration data necessary to connect to the automation engine. Let's configure the agents before starting it. Without this configuration, the agents will start fine, but will be unable to communicate with the engine. There's quite a bit in this file, but for our purposes, we focus on the connection details. We need to configure the agent name as it will be known in the automation environment and can be different from the host name. The system name, which should be common to all components and was defined when the engine was first installed, and the name of the host where the engine was installed, along with the port of the communication process. We can now start the agent. For this, we simply double-click the executable. As soon as this happens, we navigate to the web interface of Atomic Automation, which should notify us that the agent is started and is communicating. In the web interface, we should receive a yellow message notification. The message informing us that the host is now active is a sure sign that everything is working as it should. We see the agents in the list with a check mark in the authenticated column. Let's consider some of the basic functions associated with an agent. Here we are in the administration perspective of Client Zero. We open the new agents. By default, the agent is configured to be authorized for Client 100. If you have more clients configured, you can add the agent to those by enabling authorizations. You have the option of stopping an agent from Client 0. This can be left blank. We will add the agent to the Service Manager, but we will do so in the Manager itself. The surest way to establish that the agent is working is to run some sort of dummy job. This is the reason we copied the example ucbtx command locally in the agent directory. We start in Client 100 in the process assembly. To build a job, the agent requires its own login object to authenticate the system user and allow it to execute batch processes on the system. We create the object and assign it to the agents. Then we create the job and add the ucbtx command with a 30 second parameter. We then execute the job. If it runs normally, the agent is working.
We add the agent to the service manager so as to control it remotely. Atomic Automation requires the service manager to be installed on every single host where an agent is installed. A service manager dialog can then connect to any service manager in the environment and start and stop processes there. The service manager is not in scope for this video. Therefore, behind the scenes, we have installed the service manager on the agent system. We only show how to configure. First, we need to update the service manager definition file on the agent host. We add the command in the SMD file and then restart the Windows service. Next, we update the service manager dialog INI file on the engine host, since this is where we are controlling operations. We add the new host to the config file and we are good to go. To be clear, the engine has a service manager which controls all the processes on that host and is therefore irrelevant to this video. It also has a service manager dialog, which is a basic interface to control the service manager. This dialog is multi-host. It's able to connect to any Windows or Unix system in the environment, provided a separate service manager process is running on that system. The dialog is of special interest. We want to use it to connect to a service manager we have installed on the agent host to control the agents. So, on the agent host, we configure the service manager so it is able to control the agent process. Then, on the engine host, we configure the dialog so it is able to connect to the agent host. To make a process manageable by the service manager, we update its SMD file. The agent is a subservice. We add it to the manager with the define uc4 command. We name the agent and then point to the agent file and its path. The easiest way to do this is to grab the define command from the engine smd file, copy it here, and simply change the agent name. In order for this change to take effect, we need to restart the Service Manager Windows service. We now update the Service Manager dialog. We add the new host to the dialog INI file. In doing so, we make it possible for the dialog to connect to the new host. Note that this service manager connection is not secure because we didn't configure security. This wasn't the purpose of this video, but it still works fine. We're able to control the agents. In properties, you'll have the option of setting the agent start to automatic. When the agent system is restarted, the agent would start automatically. Here, we just start and stop the agent from the dialog. 